just have this great conversation with my friend Eric Scheniger, who I've known for a huge amount of time. And we actually met through social media years ago. We had connected on Twitter and we were one of the very few principals that was on Twitter sharing about what we were doing in our schools and really highlighting our staff. And that's how we actually first connected. And one of the things that really resonated with me in this podcast was when Eric talked about how important it is that we not only acknowledge the strengths of our staff and the incredible things they're already doing, but we talk about how we are doing that. Because a lot of times we we talk about, hey, here's this great thing that's happening. And then we follow it up with, but here's this thing that we're not happy about. And it's kind of like that positive sandwich, which that's the only sandwich in the world that is actually not defined what's in the middle. We say something nice, then we be mean, and then we say something nice. And people are getting re- really weary of that. And so that focus on really what are we good at and why are we good at it matters. And when he, Eric talked about this on the podcast, it reminded me of something I wrote in Innovator's Mindset in 2015. I want to share it with you all. I read an article in the Toronto Sun titled, Literacy Rates Up But Students Still Struggling With Math. This The piece about Canada's Ontario province focused entirely on math. Not one sentence celebrated the province's improvement in literacy. The focus was instead on how math instruction and learning were not up to par. Should Ontario just ignore math scores and adopt the you win some, you lose some mentality? Absolutely not. Neither should its complete focus be on improving declining math results. Yet we continue to play this game of educational whack-a-mole where one problem pops up and we focus on that until the next issue arises. We cannot forego a focus on our strengths for the sake of only emphasizing the areas where we struggle. But that's what happens time and time again. The deficit model compels administrators and educators to overcompensate in the areas that need to be fixed. When that occurs, all the great things that are already happening are quickly forgotten. The bottom line is, an environment where the message is always, we are not good enough, can be demoralizing and counterproductive for all stakeholders. That last sentence really matters because I feel right now in education, educators feeling demoralized is reality. And there's a lot of outside influences, whether it be teacher pay, you know, respect in the profession, but there's also inside influences that we have to talk about. And I think that always kind of boils down to leadership. A lot of times we get results that go out to the public and we focus on the things that we aren't doing that great but we don't highlight the things we're doing really, really well. And we need to put an emphasis on that. We need to kind of share how important that is that we're doing these great things, but also ask why are we doing this and take those strengths and apply them to the other areas as well. This is not about ignoring weaknesses. It's about starting with strengths. And there's a huge difference between the idea of being valued and feeling valued. And if people don't feel valued, it doesn't matter what you say. And so I love that we talked about this in the podcast. Eric, not only talked about this, but really great ideas for leadership, for teaching and learning. And I had a really fun conversation with him. It was really like chatting with an old friend because it was. I really know you're going to love this podcast. I loved having this conversation. I, I learned a ton from Eric and I know you will too. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey everyone, this is George Gross and welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I have a a great educator, administrator, leader, reality TV star, right? In the education space, be like my kids. I was a reality TV star in the education space. Education space. And I've known Eric uh, forever. Uh, If you don't know Eric Scheniger, you can see his information down below. Uh, He's someone I connected with uh, probably in my... I think my first year as a principal, it was, it was like first year, but later in, and he's had a huge influence on me. I know we've shared work back and forth, uh, for years. I've known Eric. And so I'm, I'm really excited to have you on the podcast. And it's just kind of fun to kind of sit down and think about the stuff that, you know, we've kind of learned over the years together. But if, if you could actually just introduce yourself to everyone, tell us what you do today and, and how you got there. It's a really great place to start. Well, first off, I want to thank you, George, for making me feel old, being that <laughs> the first principal that you followed. And that just tells me how many years that ago that was. A long oh, time ago. It's a long time. Uh, you know, my name's Eric, uh, former science teacher and principal. And, you know, I kind of thought I had it all figured out, which I did not. Mm-hmm. 
and went through kind of the a real reflective process to kind of ask, you know, who am I serving? You know, why do I do things the way I do them? How might I do them better? And what tells me if my staff and I are actually successful? So through kind of that questioning process, we worked to transform teaching, learning, and leadership in my former school. And that led to increasing achievement, winning lots of awards, hosting events such as the one yep. keynoted many years I ago. That, man. I remember that. People and then, still you, know, up, you know, people still talk to me about that. They remember seeing me there. It's crazy. And then, that you know, crazy. People, people visited from all over the world and I got asked to go and support schools. And here I am nine years later, still doing that. Well, it, I actually, and we kind of touched upon this, but um, I know one of the things that really resonated when I first connected with you was how open you were about not only what you were doing as a principal, but you were really highlighting your staff, which I thought was really, really powerful because a lot of times it's really easy to get caught up in ourselves and use these spaces just to kind of promote ourselves. And I really try my best to, you know, even this podcast is, it's a great way for people like, you know, there's times I do solo podcasts to share my thinking, but I think it's a really great way for people who know me to be exposed to other people in the education space, outside the education space. And you were blogging such a long time ago and you still continue to do this day. When you were a principal, one of the things that we talked about, you had a, a huge progression um, in your own learning. And so how did you, like, when you remember that time, kind of how did you start with your thinking as a principal? And then when you left, how was it different? Yeah, you know, my thinking was conformity, compliance, control. Mm -hmm. Students have to come in. We got to teach bell to bell. You know, they need that direct instruction. You know, that's kind of, you know, the that's the way we've always done it mentality. Yeah. Uh, that was my thinking because that was pretty much the experience that, that I went through. I mean, there were obviously some aspects that totally flew in the flew in the face of that, but, you know, so for me, you know, I, sometimes you just can't get out of your own way because right. you just don't know. You, you think you're doing the right thing. Um, I, you know, I'm not a big fan of best, the term best practice because best practice, everyone's going to do it. I think there are effective practices, but we were so focused on the chasing the shiny thing. The, what, what's the best practice? Let's go do all that. So my thinking was very siloed uh, based on experiences. But once I got on social media and I know, George, this was your eye opener because I've heard you talk about it. You've written about it. When I got on social media, that's kind of when I had my aha moment. The light bulb went on. You know, I started seeing different perspectives. I started seeing schools, districts doing amazing things, both with and without technology. And we weren't doing any of that in my school. And it began to get me to ask probably the most important question. Why? Why are we not doing this? Why are we going down the path that is often traveled? Why are we not pushing ourselves to not just think differently, to act differently, mm -hmm. to create a better experience for our learners? And, and I think that creating a personal learning network and, you know, listen, we, we can sit here and talk about it because that was kind of our start. I, I think that's kind of gotten lost by the wayside a little bit because what you've mentioned is on social media today, you have a lot of people saying, hey, here's what I'm doing. Look right. at me. Look look at where I'm at, you know, and it's me, me, me. And I do want to say that when you were talking about that, and I've, I've never, to that my knowledge, talked about this openly on a podcast or written about it. I was called out by one of my many superintendents. I had a lot of superintendents during my tenure as a principal. Right. Basically, that superintendent said, you know what? It's got to stop being the Eric show. All you're doing is talking about what you are doing. And even though I didn't like the way it was delivered, uh, that superintendent was right. And that's when I began to shift the focus from myself to my staff. Yeah. And they, and, and I think when I, when you're talking about this, one of the things that really kind of shifted that you're sharing is our, we had a different viewpoint 
of education because we immerse ourselves in some of these new learning opportunities. I think that was really powerful for me because you have, we were talking about this on the last podcast. You, you literally have a show where you were kind of like anti cell phone, do not bring this into a school. And I was the same way, but there's no video evidence of this. But I also, I don't necessarily disagree with that version of George because when I, when I went into the classrooms, it was like a computer lab. Uh, teachers were kind of like dumping kids to do typing programs. Kids were not even properly typing. It was like kind of like a, a prep period for some teachers where they could just dump in the computer or take on. So they were using technology, but not in any type of meaningful way. So it really took me kind of going in and seeing the possibilities myself before I could start thinking differently about it. That's when I started kind of, cause I was actually just like you, I was a very anti-tech um, person because I didn't see the value of it because of honestly how we're using it. And one of the, one of the things that I, I'd say with groups that are maybe, you know, they're banning devices still to this day in classrooms. The worst thing you can do is just say, Hey, we're going to let you have devices tomorrow and teach the same way that you were teaching before, because now it's going to, you're going to lose. Like you're going to, but how do you get people to think differently about how they use that? And I think both of us learn that from a place of experience. Would you say that's fair? Yeah. And, and you said the key word value, you mm -hmm. know, the, the I, I think the greatest impact a leader can have, you know, leadership is not telling people what to do. It's taking them where they need to be. Mm -hmm. And nobody wants to be told what to do. I mean, you don't want to be told what to do. I don't want to be told what to do. But if the conditions are created where we see the value, then, you know, change happens more through intrinsic motivation. You know, when I think about it wasn't just a challenge of me doing a 180 and saying no devices. Oh, now we're going to open the floodgates and do bring your own device. But then, you know, it was how did I get my how do I get my staff on board? Mm -hmm. And it took time to sh help them see the value. So I, I think in, in leadership today, it's not about doing it all. It's about how do you help those that you serve see the value in different ideas, perspectives, strategies. I, I try not to say new because a lot of the strategies might be new to a leader who's implementing for the first time. But they might not be necessarily, right. you know, new. So I think what you said is that again, how you help others see the value. But here's the thing: you, as a person with a title, if you're a leader, you first have to see the value in doing things mm -hmm. different, doing things better, breaking free from the status quo or the mentality of that's the way we've always done it, or this it's working. Why change it? And that comes back to just knowing that in education, change is a ongoing process and there's always aspects where we can grow and improve. The, the thing that you said, new doesn't mean it's better either. And I think that a lot of times uh, we can become enamored with the new stuff and it's not actually any good, but it's new. And that is appealing to a lot of people. And one of the things that I've really tried to focus on over the years is not using the term traditional to mean bad. Because sometimes you hear people like, oh, our traditional teachers. And they're saying that to say, if you do anything traditional, it's bad. Whereas I actually think some of the most powerful teaching practices like storytelling are the oldest practices ever. And so we got to kind of really be cognizant of like some of the language that we say, because not all traditional practices is bad and not all new practices is good. There, there is one thing you said, and... I want to kind of dig deep into it because it's a conversation I've been thinking about for years is a lot. You and I went on to, onto social media very early and a lot of the conversations around that time. And even maybe even today a little bit were like, Oh, you're just kind of getting yourself into an echo chamber. And there is some truth to that, but I don't think it's necessarily bad because we are also maybe a little ostracized in our own communities for doing things in a different way. And so it was kind of like, am I, is there something wrong with me? And like, and kind of going into spaces like where you kind of felt validated. 
Do you, do you know what I mean? Like there, there is a little bit of that because I'm, I understand that your superintendent said that because there's some truth, but also I'm guaranteeing that some of the people you work with were also struggling that you going in that space because it was something they had not done themselves. Oh, definitely. And you know, it's, it's like Eric went into a, a time machine, came back and was like a totally different person. You right. know, I think they thought that I was Michael J. Fox and <laughs> my Mandalorian going to uh, back to the future and stuff. But, you know, and, and I think that one thing that we often have sometimes difficulty with is not only looking at different perspectives, but understanding that our way might not always be the most effective way. And that comes back to, you know, leadership is not about having all the answers. It's about asking the right questions. It's about providing that, that feedback, that support. And I think in my case, for my staff, you know, here's me talking about PLNs and bring your own device and all these apps and tools. And it kind of overwhelmed my teachers. And it really didn't change until we we looked at and, and you you said traditional. I actually refer to those as tried and true strategies, because I agree 100 percent You know, we're not here to throw the baby out with the bathwater. But one tried and true strategy that that helped us move from echo chamber to more holistic improvement of our practice was, you know, getting in classrooms more, giving our teachers timely, practical, specific feedback, you know, really working on our learning walk protocols, um, understanding that we're here working for towards accountability for growth, not an I gotcha. And, and I think the more that we were able to get into classrooms and really, you know, understand the dynamics under which our teachers were being influenced. It really helped strengthen the bond and the relationship. And then people were more open to different ways of, you know, facilitating tier one instruction, you know, doing a closure activity. Uh, our big thing was integrating technology with purpose. I mean, that's kind of where I got my... I guess I don't want to say fame, but notoriety, mm -hmm. but it was all those tried and true aspects of leadership that really helped bring clarity to all what people perceived as different things we were asking, we were trying to do, but we were just trying to focus on the right things. Well, and the, and the, the thing that you keep talking about is it, it goes back to a continuous growth, right? And it's not just about just doing new stuff, but continuously trying to get better. And some of the stuff that we try maybe doesn't uh, work right away. And we might try to revamp it or sometimes we get rid of it and we go into a different direction. And so I know that you did a lot of that. You still do it in your own independent work, uh, you know, writing, blogging, doing all the stuff that you do. But I know you work with tons of school districts and you're seeing them grow. And the thing that I found the best school districts that I've ever worked with are, are never satisfied. Like they're continuously trying to grow and get better. And the districts that typically have the most issue think we're there. We don't, we don't need to change anything. We're good. And that's where, you know, if you're a learning organization that then it doesn't, it's, when you think that you've arrived, then you're kind of going against, you know, kind of your whole mentality of who you are. So in, in all of your travels, and I know you've worked with districts literally all over the world, when you think about some of the best organizations, especially when you're talking about leadership, is there, is there certain groups that you think of? Um, and if you, if you do, what are they doing that others could learn from? Oh, man, it's tough. You know, I've been blessed to work with so many amazing districts and schools, but a few stand out uh, for these reasons. A, there's a coherent shared vision. It's not the superintendent or principal's vision. It's here's what we agree we want to work towards. Um, it's delegation. You know, some of the schools that I work with, the principal and the superintendent, 
they're delegating responsibility because one person cannot do it all. And that's great to build capacity. Uh, it's also, you know, not just saying this is what we're doing, but having clear evidence as here is what we are actually doing. And here ha is how it's impacting quantitative and qualitative outcomes. You know, uh, two, I, I got more than two, and this is the hard part, but you put me on the spot. You know, Wells Elementary uh, is the school that my daughter went to as a fifth grader. Hmm. And, and I was fortunate to be their coach for four years. And I started with them when uh, the school opened up. And Cheryl Fisher is the principal. When I moved here to Texas, she noticed that, got me to work at her former school. Then when this school opened, she had me work with them and we had a clear plan. And we focused year one on building the foundation, year two, blended pedagogy, year three, feedback and assessment. But here's why it worked, George. You know, Cheryl was a master at articulating the vision. Here is the why. Eric is here to help us with the how and the what. Then after doing numerous coaching cycles, her leadership team would actually follow through with the feedback that I provided after each coaching cycle. And we started seeing some of the most, some of the most amazing examples that I share to this day are from Wells. Uh, currently, I'm working with a junior high school uh, in Utah. And you talk about, you kind of mentioned how some schools think that they're there. Well, Nikki Slaw is the principal of Quest Academy Junior High School in Utah. And when I first got there, I, I said to myself, why am I even here? Hmm. Because it's some of the best competency-based learning I've ever seen. There are no grades. They have, they have rubrics unpacking every standard. They have a student tracker where every morning students are looking at what they need to be to be successful. And this is what Nikki said, kind of using your words. She's like, Eric, there's always things we can get better on. Mm. And it's been probably the most challenging and gratifying implementation because we highlighted aspects, voice, choice, rigor, relevance. And that's kind of what we're working on now. But I'm telling you, they host visits from all over the country. Mm. And it's just awesome to be able to see the, you know, the fruits of their labor so, I mean, there's, then there's Corinth School District in Mississippi. You talk about a K-12 system. They have the superintendent, Dr. Lee Childress, the visionary. He provides the support. But then John Barnett, the principal at the high school, I mean, he is just tenacious, you know? He follows up on the feedback. He's, you know, providing that support to his teacher. So, you know, every while every implementation can look different, the the the, the the, the one factor that is the same with those three examples is how the leader will say they don't have all the answers. They go and get the necessary external support, but internally they are working to make sure that everyone has clarity in terms of not just what they're doing, but why are they doing it and how can they do it better? So the, the thing that I, I'm thinking about as you're talking about this, you are mentioning districts, you're mentioning schools, but you're also talking about very specific people. And one of the things that I think I've changed my thinking on is that really great leaders, what they do is they build a culture that eventually when they leave, that culture will live on after them. I don't believe that. I honestly don't believe that because I actually think culture is made up of people. And sometimes one person can totally change the culture of a school district and one person can destroy it. And it doesn't matter what the culture was before, right? Especially if you are, for example, a superintendent or you're a principal. I, I am, I'm all about innovation. That's something that's really important to me, but I also don't want to make my boss mad. And if they have a different vision than what was done before, even if the culture is great, people start to do things that appease the boss. How much do you think it is about individuals in the sense of building a culture? Cause like, I, I'm going to, you know, like I, I think a lot of things might've changed after you maybe left your school district. You know, I don't want to say, I'm sure, I'm sure they're good, but there's a lot of things that change when I'm going to say no places comment. leave. I'm going to say no comment on that part. I know, I know. And I'm, I actually know, I know, I know, actually, I think I, I knew the person who followed you as a principal and they did a great job. And I'm not saying that 
once you know, it left, everything went downhill. But I think, I think people do, I think it's not just culture. And I think a lot of people think it's a culture, but you are naming very individual people. And I think we don't give people the credit enough that we were saying, you know, cause it's not, like, and it's not like those, those people you are naming, it's only them. But if they left, would things change? That's the thing that I, I kind of want to you know, touch on. And yeah. And it's a subject that uh, try to choose my words carefully. <laughs> the, you know, it, it all starts at the top, you know, oh. the, the buck stops with the leader. So if we're talking about a district, it really is incumbent upon the superintendent to, if the principal leaves or, you know, that goes to a, a different opportunity and that school has found success you know it really is up to the superintendent and central office to ensure that the, the vision the strategies remain intact mm -hmm. so you know i i do believe that you know it is what a person might do in that position but in order to sustain it there has to be that accountability and, and i think that's one thing where you know accountability for growth you know, you can have the best vision, but the vision doesn't become action if there isn't that accountability for growth, that ongoing feedback, you know, conversations uh, based upon, you know, uh, the practices that are taking place, you know, looking at that qualitative, quantitative evidence when appropriate. So I, I think that, you know, you're right. I mean, people, individuals do have, a, can have a dramatic impact on the culture of a school or a district, but it is reliant on the, the system that's in place. Mm -hmm. What is the beliefs behind the system? You know, what are those uh, non-negotiables that in terms of this is the type of learning we are going to provide? And then what happens if that an individual doesn't follow uh, suit? with what that shared vision is. So, you know, there's so many dynamics in place, but I, I do think in some cases we are on the same page and that's why I have to call out these leaders mm. because here's the thing too, why is Cheryl Fisher able to do amazing things at Wells Elementary? Because of the vision and support that she gets right. from central office. You know, Nikki in... Uh, Quest Academy. It's because the director of mm -hmm. that academy system gives her the autonomy to go and do that. So you have other elements in place that allow people to do their most effective work. And I actually thought of something because I know you and I are both sports fans. Did you watch the Knicks growing up? Did you watch the New York Knicks? Here's where we diverge. You don't like yeah. basketball. We are, we are sports fans, but the irony here is you prefer basketball. <laughs> you like hockey. Canada, and I prefer ice hockey. I mean, it's... <laughs> it's hockey. You know, it's just hockey. I used, to, I, used, ice hockey. I used to follow the New Jersey Nets, but when they went to Brooklyn, I kind of lost my appetite. Well, okay. You know this name though, right? Pat Riley. Yes. Okay. Lakers, Knicks, Heat. See, I know my best. Exactly, right? And Pat Riley, every time he, like, there is a there is a connection. The last time the Knicks had, like, a very competitive team. They didn't win the championship. And, of course, Michael Jordan existed at that time. But they were very competitive. The heyday of the Lakers when I was growing up, Pat Riley. The Heat, heat culture, Pat Riley. And it's, like, he had different roles, but there is a there's a connection to that, too. So, like... You know, the Lakers have been good since um, the Knicks. I don't know, but that there is, it's not just an education there like, and I know, and I understand that too. Right. Because when you're talking, I think you mentioned it was Cheryl was the principal you said, and you, so part of it too, is I think a, a superintendent, when you're a principal, you don't want just a superintendent to let you do whatever you want to do. You want right. a superintendent who gives you some autonomy, but also pushes you to become better. Exactly. Yes. Right. And I think that's a really important aspect. All right. So we are, we are recording this in September. I think this is probably going to be, you know, heard by people in October. Um, as this year is kind of setting up, there might be some, you know, probably could be the most, am I going to jinx it? Could be the steadiest year we've had in a few and maybe not. 
you know, what, what do you, what advice would you give to like a leadership team, you know, in the 2023, 2024 school year to make it the best possible year? Cause there's a lot of, there's a lot of people. I don't want anything to do with education. They're ready to leave. They're ready to go out. What would you say is your best advice to people as they're kind of going into this year? I think it's, it's twofold. Number one, really spend the time to flesh out what you do well. Why do you do it that way? Well, how do you do it? And what tells you that you're successful? You know, I, I think in education, there's a lot of opportunity to really commend, praise, to provide that positive reinforcement because we know there's some great, great practices happening, but maybe, maybe it's spending time to really flesh those out, not just through an email, but during a faculty meeting, through a short video clip, phone calls, post-it notes, you know, making it personal, you know, telling those stories too, you know, telling your staff what they do well and why is great, but also, and, and you mentioned storyteller earlier is, you know, how do we begin to craft those narratives that really showcase all the great stuff that's happening? Because you know what? We all know the saying, if you don't tell your story, someone else will. And if they tell that story, it might not be the one we want told. You know, we really want to start with the positives. And, you know, you have your famous quote. If I butcher it, I apologize. <laughs> don't make the positives so loud that the negatives you can't hear. Something like that. Actually, You're pretty maybe, bang on. Maybe, maybe my, you, didn't you get a tattoo version, of that? Maybe my version is better. No, no, thank you. No, thank you. Um, <laughs> The other thing is, on the other side is, really be honest about where you can grow. And I'm very careful with my words. I don't use effective, ineffective, good, bad. Where are you? Where do you want to be? And I think when we start looking at growth is, you know, it begins with being humble and understanding, hey, you know what? Growth starts with me. How will I model my learning? How will I be vulnerable and share some stories with my staff saying, hey, you know what? Maybe I, you know, we, I wasn't really, we weren't really running high functioning PLCs because as leaders, we weren't modeling that for you. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to do a better job, not telling you what to do, but showing you how it can be done. So I think asking those right, those, developing the right questions. I know when I coach, you know, I will model for leaders, you know, asking the right questions can really unearth where those areas to grow are. And after visiting classrooms, I'll say, well, okay, you're going to engage a teacher, you know, ask them, what do they think, how they think the lesson went? What would they do differently? Then listen, and then follow up with, well, how do you know learning occurred? Um, how did you challenge all learners, regardless of where they were? You know, how did you personalize learning to meet the diverse needs in class? How was technology used in a purposeful way? And trying to find those right questions because questions are more important than answers. So figure out what you do well, why, share, share, share. And then really start to have uh, honest conversations about what you need to do to get better because leadership is saying, I don't know and I need help. And on the second area, it's, there is no shame in saying, I need help. I always tell schools and districts, listen, my job is to work myself out of a job. I might not be the best fit to help, help you with your professional growth trajectory. However, you know, sometimes it's difficult to be a prophet in your own land. And sometimes you need an unbiased lens to really yeah. help you look at things differently. Well, they, so with the, and I, I totally agree with that because I think there's, you and I both believe it's very imperative that organizations build leadership within that you, you create that culture where, you know, but you also do need some outsider perspectives because sometimes we just don't know what we don't know. Right. Like I, and I've said this forever, some of the districts that I work with think they're the best district in the world because they've never looked at anyone outside their district. So they just assume that everything they're doing is amazing. And I think that was one of the things that we really benefited from early on in our career is we went looking to see what other districts were doing, other schools were doing and asking like, why can't we do that? Like, why can't we actually create that? 
the thing that I think is, and I've talked about this forever, and it's so important to me, is when you talked about starting to focus on what you do really well, but also what is it that you're doing that makes it really good? Because I, I, I see sometimes people are like, oh, look at these scores. We're really good here. And then they just, now we're going to crap on you. But they don't actually like dig in to saying like, hey, what are we doing in these areas that are making us good? And maybe in some of the areas where we're struggling, maybe we should use some of those same practices and move them there. Because that, that idea, you know, a lot of times it's like, it's the, it's the crap sandwich. I'm going to say something nice to you, but then I'm going to start getting on your case about what you do wrong. And then, and then I'll say something nice to you because, you know, it wasn't a mean conversation, but actually digging in. Like, I think that's a, that's a really important aspect that you talked about. Yep. I, you know, listen, I, I'm still looking for answers. Um, right. but, but I think in, often we, we, in education, we tend to make things more difficult than they actually are. You know, I agree we, with you. we want to focus on less to do more. I don't care about the buzzwords, you know, what's the latest fad. I mean, I can go in and you probably can too. And any word it's sometimes it's word salad yeah. and it's really getting to the heart at what are you trying to do? And I hear that a lot with, with personalization mm -hmm. and I break it down. Hey, listen, personalization is not putting all kid on, kids on a device and having them go through an adaptive learning tool. Personalization is all learners getting what they need, when and where they need it to succeed. Mm -hmm. So what does that look like for you? I'm not here to say that you have to do it lockstep A, B, C, D, but how do you help all learners succeed? Maybe it's through RTI. Maybe it's through MTSS. Maybe it's through differentiation. You know, maybe it's through, you know, high functioning PLCs. But again, in education, we kind of have a, a mental, our, our mentality is when we hear new words, we think it's going to be more work, but we got to focus on doing better work. The, the, the thing, and I'll end with this, because I, I appreciate you, that really good example. The buzzword thing drives me crazy and buzzwords, a lot of times words that are actually really important in education actually become buzzwords because people just say them, but don't actually can't articulate what they mean by it. And so what you did really well, and I thought that was a great example, you talked about personalization, but then you clearly defined it. And when people say a word when I'm in districts and they say it over and over again, I'm like, what do you mean by that? Explain that to me. And then they're like, ah, cause no, like a lot of times they're not even asked that and they're kind of thrown off. I'm like, you keep saying, you know, it's kind of like that meme. You keep saying that word. I don't know. I don't know if you think you know what it means. Right. So I thought that was a great example, but Hey man, it's been awesome to kind of catch up with you. I know um, you're doing some really great work and what's cool. I'm going to see you, you and I are both at GATC in Georgia. It is, I've been there before. I'm telling you, it's one of the best conferences I've ever been to. You're going to, you're going to absolutely love it. So um, I'm glad that you're going to be there and I'm going to be there kind of like uh, heckling you when you're speaking. That's great because now I'm going to heckle you with a question. <laughs> well, since we're still there, I'm going to ask you a question. You have to answer. You All can't right. say goat, Michael Jordan or LeBron. Michael James. Jordan. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Michael Jordan, not even close. There's, it didn't matter who you're going to say after that. Gotcha. It's Michael Jordan. <laughs> Even if you would have said someone else's name, I would just said Michael Jordan. You never know. You never know. That's yeah, Michael Jordan. It's Michael Jordan. It's not even close. You can't. The guy went to six championships. He won them all. Like, is, he's the best. I'm just putting it out there. I'm sure people out there wanted to hear your response to that. <laughs> it was Michael Jordan. And Wayne Gretzky. Wayne Gretzky. Who's, who's the best uh, football player of all time? I'm curious who you're going to say there. That's that is. that's an easy one. It's Tom Brady. There's not even a question. Yeah, yeah. He's I won more you're... championships yeah, you're right, alone you're right. than any team has won championships. No, no, you're right. You're right. Tom Brady. There you go. go the, we just figured out all the go conversations. We just figured yeah. them all out. Maybe one day we can come on and we can talk about American soccer and figure out who the goat is. Yeah, all right. All right. <laughs> no, I'm not gonna know that one. All right. Hey, man, it's good to see you. Everyone, thank you so much for watching. I know I learned a ton, so I hope you uh, benefit as well. Have a wonderful day.